It's almost 1 p.m. in Sydney. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets Asia. I'm Paul Allen. Here are the top stories. Markets making a cautious start to the new quarter as investors digest mixed data on Chinese factory activity. An upbeat Tankan survey adding to the case for a BOJ rate hike maybe as soon as this month. Also ahead, the euro gains as France's national rally wins the first round election, but with a smaller margin than some polls were indicating. Plus, we hear exclusively from the Sumitomo CEO about their strategy for yen weakness and the energy transition. All right, uh, let's have a look at how markets are trading in Asia at the moment. Something of a mixed bag around the region right now. We do have the Nikkei in positive territory by a quarter of 1%. We did, of course, have those uh, tank and survey numbers out earlier. Pretty good, really. Um, some of the uh, readings were perhaps a little weaker than anticipated, but the large manufacturing index in particular uh, was uh, better than what we were expecting, an improvement on the quarter prior, and uh, seems to keep the door wide open for some BOJ tightening at the end of this month. Uh, elsewhere, we do have Hong Kong closed, of course, uh, commemorating the uh, 1997 handover. The Shanghai Composite, though, only a few points in positive territory, better by a tenth of 1%. Here in Australia, meanwhile, we are home to one of the market's only other um, underperforming markets at the moment, the ASX off by about four tenths of 1%. Well, China's Taishin manufacturing PMI expanded in June to the highest level in three years, and that diverged again with official data reflecting a weakness in factory activity. China correspondent Min Min Lo joins us now with the details. So, Min Min, conflicting numbers. What do they tell us? Yes, that Taizhi Manufacturing Index really surprising to the upside, coming in at 51.8, beating expectations of 51.5. Now, this is the strongest print we've seen since May of 2021. It's the eighth consecutive month of expansion and really telling a very different story from the official PMI Index, which came in flat in June, contracting for a second straight month. Now, the reason for this divergence is that the Taizhi Index tends to capture the smaller export-oriented firms, while the official index tends to capture the larger state-owned enterprises. So what this means is that exports is still doing much of that heavy lifting to keep factories going, while perhaps the slower domestic consumption is now weighing on the supply side as well. We're seeing gauges for input and output prices slipping slightly in June, which suggests stri uh, slightly stronger deflationary pressures on factory gate prices. And also we have those trade tensions ratcheting up as well. Increasingly, more trade barriers erected against Chinese producers. That's also going to weigh on manufacturing going forward. All right, let's uh, talk about the services and construction PMIs as well. We saw a, a bit of a slowdown for those metrics also. That's right. The non-manufacturing PMI came in below expectations, hovering just above 50 now. The expectation was for 51. Uh, and uh, perhaps the most di disappointing was the construction sub-index, which had fallen to 52.3 versus 54.4 the previous month. This really suggests that those government-led infrastructure investment is losing steam a little bit. That has been quite critical to recovery. So stronger stimulus certainly will be needed going forward. We're expecting that to come from more fiscal measures given the constraints of monetary easing now with the PBOC being very reluctant to cut rates uh, given the pressure on the yuan. So home sales are uh, continuing to slow also uh, even as cities uh, easing home buying curbs is, uh, is the medicine not working? Yeah, well, home sales is down 17%. Some of those measures are working because that, that decline is now slower than the previous month in May. The decline was 34%, so much steeper decline in May, uh, which suggests that those home buying curves that are being eased in first-tier cities are taking effect. We are seeing this 30% jump in home sales in the first 25 days on, of June compared to May in places like Shenzhen and Guangzhou. These are the cities that have slashed down payment ratios 
officials and either removed or lowered those mortgage rate floors to make home loans cheaper. But still, uh, overall, economists think that we're still not out of the woods yet when it comes to the property sector, and they're calling on the government and the PBOC to really double the liquidity that they're injecting into that home buyback program to mop up those excess unsold homes. And of course, we still have plenty of uh, developers that have been struggling really in default for more than a year, and they're really counting on this sales revival to help persuade debt holders and to fight off their liquidation. Paul. All right, China correspondent Min Min Lo there. So uh, let's get a bit more on markets and the picture in China and Japan. Also head of FX and macro analysis for Asia at InTouch Capital Markets joins us now. Todd, thank you so much uh, for your time today. Uh, I want to start off, if we can, in China. Still pretty sluggish readings on these PMIs. The official PMIs over the weekend uh, weren't too great. Uh, try the uh, Taishan read a little bit better. Um, but we do have manufacturing still in contractionary territory. We've got this plenum, of course, coming up in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, how much longer do you think policymakers are going to stick with these incremental measures to support growth? When might we see something a little bit more convincing? I, I think you hit the nail on the head there, that it's going to take more than incremental measures uh, to restore confidence among international investors. Um, and we just aren't seeing uh, any of the kind of big bang type of stimulus measures uh, that might go further uh, to convincing investors that a base in the economy is in and that a base in, in terms of asset prices uh, may be in. And I, I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. Um, and I think that, if anything, when we look out at the rest of the year at some of the forces uh, that are going to be shaped shaping uh, how international investors are approaching markets. Uh, we have a swirl of politics across the globe, uh, and I'm not sure that that is going to be positive for China, particularly uh, when we look at some of the stances uh, that we're seeing uh, in terms of potential U.S. trade measures uh, against China. Uh, so I'm relatively pessimistic, and certainly it's going to take more uh, than marginal beats like we saw in terms of today's data. Yeah, and against that backdrop, we've got a yuan that just keeps on grinding ever lower. What's the flaw here? And do you see that picture changing anytime soon in an era of rate divergence? You know, in terms of rate divergence, I think that the big factor there is the Fed and that expectations uh, are that they have scope to be patient. Uh, and the market, of course, uh, you know, has pushed back over over time, uh, its expectations on both the speed and magnitude uh, of Fed tightening in response to the persistent strength in data uh, and uh, the rhetoric that we're hearing from Fed officials. Uh, so until we get kind of closer uh, to the cusp uh, of Fed easing, or until we see uh, more of a change uh, in terms of U.S. data flow, uh, I think that that is going to be hard for kind of currencies all across the globe uh, to post a sustained uh, rally against the dollar. You know, I would say that that's probably 80, 85 percent U.S dollar factors and only 15 percent domestic factors, even when we look at big economies like China. Well, let's uh, talk about data flow and another big economy, uh, of course, uh, Japan. The, uh, the Tankan reading, uh, pretty good, especially when you consider the large manufacturing index. Uh, what's this going to mean uh, for the tightening path for the Bank of Japan? Sounds like the doors are uh, well and truly open to a move at the end of the month. I think that the door is open, and we have heard, of course, the rumblings or the more overt signals from the Bank of Japan uh, that they are uh, looking to tweak uh, bond buying. However, um, you know, I think that it's a similar situation when we look at, at kind of how this is going to play out in markets, where marginal adjustments uh, by the Bank of Japan it's not clear that that's going to have a lot of fallout when there are these broader macro factors uh, at play. And certainly investors don't seem convinced. Because when we look at things like positioning data uh, for the Japanese yen, what seems to be happening is that investors are actually selling the yen into rallies. Things like the IMM show buildup uh, of yen shorts. And what that means is that there just isn't a lot of fear uh, of a change in policy from the BOJ. And there isn't a lot of fear, at least at these levels, uh, that we're going to see uh, uh, convincing intervention uh, to strengthen the end. Uh, in terms of intervention, is the Ministry of Finance somewhat on the horns of a dilemma here uh, because we're past the level where they intervened before? Is there a risk to their credibility if they don't do something this time? 
I guess the glass half full interpretation would be that we're roughly at the same levels we were uh, when they intervened uh, in the first two rounds. Uh, however, I, I think that the market does want to test them, uh, that the pattern here is that the market is uh, going to kind of goad them into action. Uh, and I think that the expectation is uh, that so long as we don't see a rapid acceleration in terms of the pace uh, of uh, yen uh, decline, that the intervention is more likely around the 165 level uh, for dollar yen. Uh, and as to whether or not it's going to be effective, certainly they have a large degree of buyer power still. Uh, so I, I think that in the short term, it does stand to be a bit effective, but we'll have to see some shift in those broader global macro factors uh, before there is kind of bigger relief for dollar yen. Well, if you take a look at yen expectations uh, from the Tankan survey, businesses see it around 145. Of course, uh, we're looking backwards here. It seems like a rather uh, quaint estimate now, but that is weaker than the estimate that we saw in the first quarter survey. Now, of course, this weekend is pretty good if you're an exporter or if you're a tourism operator, but are we getting to the point here where the benefits are starting to be outweighed by the drawbacks? I think that, as you kind of allude to, it is a double-edged sword uh, where uh, this is going to push up the price of some imports uh, as well. And so, you know, there, there are conflicting impacts on the Japanese economy, uh, but I think that kind of a, a marginal uh, further weakening in the yen, so long as we don't see an acceleration uh, in terms of the pace, it's not clear that that's going to be the decisive factor uh, for domestic economic activity. Well, uh, in terms of the yen, of course, a lot of it depends on the other half of that currency pair, what's going on with the U.S. dollar. And, uh, of course, the PCE index was a pretty encouraging in terms of inflation cooling. Uh, what are your expectations around easing from the Fed uh, with that piece of data in mind? Uh, you know, I think when we look at what the market is pricing in, we're fully pricing in one hike this year and the strong risk uh, that we see, too, that that's probably about right for the time being, uh, because we need to wait on additional data flow. Uh, that's the reality. And we're not going to have clarity uh, for another couple of months. We're not going to have clarity uh, when Chairman Powell speaks at Sintra. Uh, we're not going to have clarity uh, when he speaks uh, in his semiannual testimony uh, before Congress, uh, because we don't get the next CPI reading uh, until after uh, these development. So if we do start to see uh, more slowing in terms of the CPI, I think that will reinforce uh, prospects in terms of market perceptions uh, that we do see uh, two easings uh, by the Fed this year. Uh, however, I think that for the time mm -hmm. being, uh, they probably are stuck in a bit of a range uh, as we await uh, that key data. Um, and I think that that probably means that the trends that are broadly in place uh, in terms of asset prices, where this has been a pretty good environment for equities, uh, and we've seen the dollar uh, trade strongly, but, uh, you know, not really shooting higher uh, at this point, that those trends are probably going to continue. Mm -hmm. Todd, just as you're speaking there, we have on the bottom of the screen uh, that China's 10-year bond yield has uh, just declined to the lowest on record. I'm just wondering if you've got a quick reaction to that. Uh, you know, uh, again, I, I think that when we look at, at kind of the moves in, in, in Chinese yields, uh, that that can be down to, to kind of technical factors. Uh, but I don't really see this signaling any major shift in terms of the macro environment. All right, Todd Elmer of InTouch Capital Markets is sticking around. We're going to talk uh, politics and political risk in a moment. And uh, coming up on Bloomberg Markets Asia, we're going to also discuss the outlook for Indian assets with Anand Rathi Private Wealth Management. Hear their thoughts on the biggest market risks. That's just ahead. First, though, Marine Le Pen's national rally scores an emphatic victory in the first round of France's legislative election. We're going to discuss the implications of that up next. This is Bloomberg. In an unambiguous vote, the French people have demonstrated their desire to turn the page after seven years of contemptuous and corrosive power. We warmly thank the voters and welcome this result. This first step towards choosing an alternative is a mark of confidence which honors and obliges us. 
French National Rally leader Marine Le Pen speaking after her party dominated the first round of legislative elections. So uh, with that in mind, let's take a look at how European futures are trading along with the euro. It's going to be an interesting day in Europe today. Uh, futures, though, pointing better by 1.2%. We also saw the euro rallying as well because while the national rally did perform extremely well, didn't quite perform as well as expected. We do, of course, have round two coming up next weekend. If we take a look at uh, bond futures as well, well, the spread between French and German 10-year bonds has been widening. be interesting to see if we get some relief on that today. All right, for more on uh, the election in Europe, uh, let's bring in Bloomberg's Derek Wallbank. So, uh, Derek, the national rally dominating, uh, not doing perhaps as well as some polls were predicting, but what's in store for round two? Well, Paul, it's a really interesting uh, sort of result here. Remember, uh, Emmanuel Macron called this uh, trying to get a little bit more of a boost. Uh, that seems to not have happened, uh, and quite aggressively not have happened. His bloc coming in third in the first uh, round of voting, and Le Pen's far right side uh, coming out of this in the poll position. Now, how does this translate to a majority and being able to work its will? Well, the magic number in French uh, politics is 289 seats. The projected seats off of the vote share that uh, that National Rally was able to get is somewhere between 230 to 305. Now, that is a very wide number, and it's also complicated by the fact that in this two-step process, there is a way for candidates who make runoffs uh, to maybe step back and consolidate support. You've seen across French elections uh, going back a couple of years that sometimes after the first round there is a sort of bringing together to try and stop the far right. There are indications that that may happen again with some on the left and some in the center giving up their seats to make way for the other in order to try and block uh, the far right candidate in a one-on-one -on -one sort of uh, situation, not split the vote. You're also seeing a situation, as you alluded to, where you are seeing some market move because the initial uh, the initial thought result versus what actually wound up happening maybe not quite uh, on the same level. We saw this in India. We're seeing this again here. And so that's sort of what we're watching for right now. As I say, you saw the move in the euro there uh, reflecting the fact that maybe there's less of a chance uh, than was initially thought that Le Pen's uh, party will be able to command an absolute majority. It will be interesting to see what happens in the next two days to see if there is that consolidation and whether or not the, the left and the center can hold together. Yeah, let's uh, talk about the upcoming U.S. election as well. Uh, looking back at that uh, interesting debate on Friday, according to a CBS News poll, just 28 percent of people now think Joe Biden should even be running. Uh, where are we heading with this uh, conversation? Well, Paul, maybe 28 percent in that CBS poll, but Joe Biden has a commanding lead in the number of delegates required to be uh, considered the Democratic presidential nominee. Right now, we're in a position where the person standing between Joe Biden and the nomination is Joe Biden. Uh, Biden has control of the process here. He basically, if he wants to be the nominee, he's going to be the nominee. It would, it would be very, very difficult to dislodge him without his own willingness for lots of complicated reasons that all boil down to a question of whether or not certain people who are skeptical that Biden can win can persuade him to drop out. Now, it should be said that Joe Biden has been in a sort of similar situation before. Recall that when he actually won, he was getting some, some comments from people ahead of the South Carolina primary saying, you can't win, you should consider doing something else. He stayed in, he won South Carolina, he won, wound up winning the nomination. And there is some precedent in the U.S. for someone who had a very bad first debate later correcting and winning. Barack Obama saw this in 2012, but Biden's was probably worse by an order of magnitude than Obama's loss in that first debate. All right, Bloomberg's Derek Wallbank there. Let's get back to Todd Alma, head of FX and macro analysis for Asia at InTouch Capital Markets. He's uh, staying with us. Uh, I do want to talk politics, but let's keep away from the candidates uh, because it doesn't matter who wins. They've both got pretty aggressive spending plans. Uh, do you have a, 
little bit of fear about you that maybe we'll see inflation making a comeback in 2025. I think that's certainly a concern, um, you know, and it's one of the reasons why uh, I would question the durability uh, of what seems to be a consensus uh, that if President Trump wins, uh, we are going to see a rally in terms of asset prices. We've asked investors informally several times uh, whether they think that would be the case, and very consistently, uh, the answers that we're getting from investors is that they think that the 2016 uh, uh, template is going to be uh, uh, play out again, uh, where we can see asset prices benefit uh, from things like corporate tax cuts. However, I don't think that it is quite that clear cut uh, in that if we do see even more aggressive tariffs uh, than we saw with the last uh, Trump administration, uh, should former President Trump win, uh, and if we do see some of the moves uh, that uh, President Trump and his allies have suggested uh, on immigration, which has the potential to shrink the labor force, uh, those risks being inflationary, uh, those risks complicating uh, the Fed's hand. Uh, and I think that uh, as we move closer to the election, these are the questions uh, that investors are going to have to grapple with. Of course, the election, not until November, and uh, a lot of things could happen between now and then. But uh, let's get back to France, where we've got a second round of voting coming up on Sunday. Um, now, we did have the euro, a number of other European assets uh, performing a little bit uh, better. Uh, some of the futures looking better as well after the national rally didn't perform quite as well as expected. Um, can you talk to us about your case for the euro from here? Uh, sorry, we missed the last bit there. Uh, yeah, Todd, I'm just uh, wondering if you can still hear me. Uh, I just want you to, in the light of what happened in France over the weekend, uh, what's your case from the euro from here? I think that the euro investors are probably going to approach that as a sell on rallies. And the issue is that, um, you know, we were within the realm of expectations, uh, but the market seems to have reacted mildly positively when we look at things like spreads uh, and the bounce in terms of the euro uh, to the fact that some of the more negative tail risks uh, did not play out with a more convincing win uh, from the Le Pen bloc, uh, which might have uh, convincingly given them uh, an outright uh, majority. Uh, however, as Derek already stated, what we know is that it's still possible uh, that we are going to see an outright majority. And I think that that is going to limit uh, the scope uh, for a rebound uh, into the next round of the election. I think that there is greater uncertainty in this election than we saw in previous elections around tax voting potentially blocking the far right uh, because participation was very high this time uh, and it's not clear that that is going to be a dominant factor. I think that that limits upside for euro and, and kind of remarkably given the turmoil uh, of the past several years, I think there's a lot less uh, uncertainty with the upcoming UK election and that means investors may actually look at, at kind of rallies in euro sterling as opportunities to sell ahead of the election in the UK. All right, uh, Todd Elmer, unfortunately we're out of time. We can't talk about the UK, but of course that election coming up at the end of the week as well. Todd Elmer of InTouch Capital Markets there. We have plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Let's check in on China rare earth stocks performing pretty strongly. Uh, all of them there in green territory advancing after China vowed for more protection of its critical minerals. Rare earths belong to the country. No organization or individual is allowed to claim them. These are the words of the state council. Well, reminding us all that China is, after all, a communist country. China rare earth stocks are performing pretty strongly there. OK, going in the other direction, let's take a look at uh, the 10-year yields on uh, China bonds. Well, that's uh, slipped to the lowest ever. So um, investors continuing to snap up bonds. Uh, this is about uh, amid pessimism about the economy, expectations for further stimulus as well. So the 10-year government yield declining uh, to 2.187. Plenty more to come. This is Bloomberg.
All right, welcome back. China markets just heading out to their lunch break. Uh, this is how things are looking at the moment. Got a little bit of softness for the CSI 300, the Shanghai Composite uh, in slightly better territory. And we did see a moment ago rare earth stocks uh, doing pretty well in China at the moment. Um, uh, we've got a very weak yuan though, and as I mentioned a moment ago as well, a uh, Chinese tenure that has now hit an historic low, that government bond rally showing no signs of slowing down. This is despite the PBOC saying uh, it might, thinking about it, selling some of its own holdings uh, to cool the advance. We've also got uh, Japan just coming back from its lunch break, and it's a reasonably positive day so far for Japanese equities. The Nikkei better by about a quarter of 1% at the moment. We had a pretty solid Tankan survey out earlier as well, uh, particularly for the large manufacturing read. Uh, the yen, meanwhile, though, still uh, looking pretty weak. Uh, did break through 161. In fact, it's just done it again. There we go, 161. So we are, as always, on intervention. Watch uh, the 10-year yield uh, creeping up ever so slightly. Uh, for more on the markets, let's get over to Bloomberg M Life strategist Mark Cranfield. And Mark, I want to start off on that tank and survey for the second quarter. Uh, a pretty decent set of numbers there. Is this another green light for the BOJ as a pond is tightening at the end of the month? Yeah, it's probably the, the final piece in the jigsaw for them. So just in the past week, they've had pretty decent Tokyo CPI numbers. They've had strong industrial output numbers as well. You add in a Tenkan, which is all round, but pretty decent, particularly for the large manufacturing companies. The outlook was very strong as well. They've already had the, the wage rises that they needed. They were saying for a long time they wanted to see people being paid more in their wages. Well, that's happened. All of the rounds this year, in fact, mostly exceeded expectations. So that's fallen into place. You've also, as you were saying there, the yen is extremely weak. They certainly need help from the Bank of Japan. So all of these things are starting to fall into place. And very importantly as well, the market has priced it in. So finally, two-year yields in Japan are actually pricing in a 25 basis point rate hike from the central bank. Now, around the world, particularly in the G10 complex, it's very rare for central banks to raise interest rates unless they see the two-year part of the curve fully pricing for such an event. Well, Japan may not raise by 25 basis points. Last time it was only 10. They may do something like 15 basis points this time round. But at least the market is fully pricing it. It means the Bank of Japan will not be shocking anybody if they go ahead and raise interest rates this month. And that is what most central banks want to see. They want to see that the market is already there and they're just guiding them into the place where they already know they are. So from that point of view, everything is falling into place. It would be a surprise if the Bank of Japan doesn't do something at the end of the month. Um, what are we expecting to hear, though, in terms of the bond buying program? Is there still a bit of a mystery to be addressed in that regard? It's, <clears throat> there's going to be a reduction. I think that's pretty much what they've signalled. I don't think anybody would be surprised about that. It's really a question of the magnitude. And certainly, if they want to have an impact on the currency, if they want to really help to support the yen, it needs to be quite a large reduction in purchases. Some of the numbers which have been talked about is just reducing the, the purchases by 500 million. Well, that's probably not really going to do it. They probably need to come in with a big bazooka type number, a number which overwhelms market people. So something bigger than analysts are already expecting. And to bring it forward, to do it straight away, there's some suggestions that they're going to talk about it in July, but they might not act on it straight away. But if they, if they come with the measures and start reducing bond purchases straight away, and they do an interest rate hike at the same time, that would certainly be a big message to the, or to the markets that they're serious about supporting the yen. And probably it would then push the ball towards the Ministry of Finance, who could say there'll be more intervention as well. You could get a, a double movement here where Bank of Japan and the Ministry of Finance are finally on the same page, acting together, and it could draw a line in the sand for the yen. Uh, what else might help the yen? Something from the Fed, perhaps. Uh, let's turn to the question of the day today, because, of course, we had that uh, soft PCI reading out of the US. Uh, does this deliver a bond rally in the second half? It certainly helps. The, the, the fact that the, the PCE was pretty much in line, it's one less thing for the Federal Reserve to worry about. They've been caught offside 
a couple of times this year already where interest or inflation numbers came in a bit higher than expected. So at least they can relax. They've seen this data. There's no surprises there. So that will form part of their discussion and it may well give them more reason. But they need more data than simply one PCE report, particularly the, the CPI numbers, the core numbers are still running too high for their liking. And the jobs market is very, very strong in the United States. So certainly it helps um, and it probably means that they can keep to this idea of at least one interest rate cut this year. But whether or not it brings it forward is really an open question. There's probably not enough in that one piece of data to justify an early interest rate cut. But certainly it goes some way towards the argument that they can afford to lower interest rates this year. And if they do, of course, that will probably undermine the US dollar. The Japanese will be one of the people very happy to see that because they've been having no relief from the US dollar at all. But the Japanese authorities need to do more than just um, waiting for the Fed. They need to do things on their own side as well. But certainly, lower interest rates in the US is a big factor for everybody in the emerging market space. It will help the Chinese authorities would also be relieved to see that as well. All right, Tim, live strategist Mark Cranfield there. Well, one of Warren Buffett's favorite Japanese trading houses says a weaker currency has some upside for the company, but is worrisome for the future of Japan. We spoke exclusively with Sumitomo CEO Shingo Ueno about the firm's strategy and expansion plans amid yen weakness. Last three years, we have been working for the structural reform. So now it's uh, changed the mood. I would like to change the mood from defense to offense. So in other words, you know, we will have to make uh, realize the, the dramatic growth uh, in next three years. That's why I ch try to change that our company's mindset. Then the main theme is number one in each business line. Mm. So that's a kind of that mindset, but at the same time, I would like to, uh, you know, accelerate the reallocation of our management resources into the focus area. Mm. That's the main part. Tell us a little bit about those focus areas, because as you said, you have so many different business lines. Exactly. That's right. That's right. Yes. Uh, there are, you know, uh, especially there, there are eight business lines. We are estate or steel, steel businesses, healthcare, agriculture, so many things. Just uh, I pick up three examples. One is agriculture business, agri, agri businesses. We are, we, are, we are, you know, doing the fertilizer or, or biochemical that we will ex expand to the seed cells or, or, or in addition to that, the other type of the, you know, agricultural products mm -hmm. we, are, we are now selling. In the, Latin America, in Europe, and we would like to expand. That, that's the first one. And second one is the construction machinery businesses. Historically, we have been working in Canada and the United States. It, it's a uh, sales and also the rental business. The rental business will be expanded to the Singapore and other uh, South, Southeast countries, and then we are targeting to the Europe. Mm. That's the second one. The third one is the real estate that we would like to develop that the city or urban development project mm. centered on real estate. Mm. That, that, that's what I think. All those three ha, has the strongest experience or you know, competitive advantage. When you're talking about expansion in your business, yes. are we talking about growth coming organically or even through M&As? Even through m and how would a very cheap Japanese yen play into that strategy? Because m and become more expensive mm -hmm. when the yen is this weak. Exactly. However, we just account on that uh, dollar basis. So that's why not, nothing changed, regardless, regardless of the yen depreciation or, or you know, appreciations. We, we would like to see that what is the value in dollar, and then we will decide to invest into those businesses or not. So then we, at the same time, the businesses where we are confident will increase the mm. corporate value, mm. that, 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 that company's value. Then we decided to go into the investment. 
Does that so, mean that so far you're not seeing a meaningful impact from mm. the depreciation of the yen? I don't think so. Do you expect to see more meaningful impact? Because I know that your yen assumption for until March of 2025 was mm -hmm. 140. Mm -hmm. We're around 160 and people are talking about <laughs> 170. I know, I know. When I, when I uh, made that uh, mid midterm plan, uh, my assumption was that, our assumption was that the uh, US-Japan interest gap will be narrower at that time. But actually, as you said, that, you know, uh, the, the yen is depreciate, uh, depreciated further. So uh, I'm not sure what, what will happen in the future, but I think the, the interest gap will be slowly narrower and then yen depreciation maybe ch uh, change to the appreciations. But uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, it, is, it is good for, for our company to some extent because that the yen is, yen, yen is depreciated and one yen maybe, uh, how much, two, two billion? No, no, two billion yen Increase. A depreciation yeah. well, of one, one yen one, would actually yes, equal yes, yes. to two billion yen two million in, increase, increase. in profit. In profit. Mm. However, such a prolonged, say, uh, Japanese yen depreciation will not good for the country's strength in, 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 in the long run, you know. That's Sumitomo CEO Shingo Ueno speaking exclusively with our colleague Sherry Ann in Tokyo. Still to come, Anand Rathi Private Wealth Management says rising geopolitical tensions and elevated rates could drag on Indian assets. Their market outlook up next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Markets Asia. You're watching the India Focus and here's a look at Indian markets just ahead of the open. Bit of a mixed bag at the moment. Uh, pretty tepid actually. It looks like we're setting up for a pretty flat start, uh, which is um, unusual considering what we've seen so far in the first half. India's stock markets have been riding a bullish trend, both the Sensex and the Nifty rallying in the first half of the year. Small and mid caps have remained in favour with strong demand from retail investors. So let's discuss third quarter investment strategy with Shweta Rajani, Senior Vice President and Mutual Funds Head at Anand Rathi Private Wealth Management. Shweta, thanks so much for joining us today. So yeah, great first half for Indian equities. Uh, as we head into the second half, what's the outlook for you? Is this still a, a buy the dips market? Hello, good morning. Uh, yes, I would say this is a market where it's fairly priced, especially, you know, the large and small cap segment, uh, mid cap also in pockets. So uh, definitely a market to buy. Uh, the upside that we've seen in the first half, we can very much expect that to continue even in, uh, you know, the forthcoming quarters as well. So fundamentals in place and therefore definitely a buy, I would say. So we've got uh, foreign infl inflows likely to rise in the next 10 months as well, because, of course, on Friday, Indian bonds were included in the JP Morgan Emerging Market Bond Index. That might prop up the rupee near historic lows as well. Uh, do you think the RBI might be uh, looking at easing in its next couple of meetings? Yes. So, uh, you know, definitely you mentioned the inclusion in the JP Morgan bond index. We're expecting $30 billion to come in because of that inclusion. We've already seen, you know, once the news is out, uh, there have been around $12 billion coming in into the market. And that's going to have cascading effects, not just on pushing down the bond yields, but also giving a favorable uh, equity market valuation, giving some comfort to the rupee. Uh, so that's definitely a positive and will have, you know, multi-effect on various asset classes. So, uh, yes, it could mean, uh, you know, RBI looking at rate cuts, uh, where, but whenever that happens, bond yields is definitely uh, getting pushed down and equity markets uh, rising to, you know, to that effect because of fund flows coming in. 
Yeah, we've seen some pretty good traction uh, with uh, large cap stocks. Is that where you see the money rotating now, or is this uh, smaller investor passion for small and mid cap stocks uh, likely to continue? So actually, uh, you know, if you look at this, there's actually money flowing in in all the three segments of large, mid, small. But in terms of proportion, there's more money heading towards large cap. That's given because, you know, if I'm looking at the three market capitalizations, uh, large cap is slightly favorably valued compared to the other two. But, you know, if I just look at the monthly money that comes in the form of SIPs, which is around 21,000 uh, rupees per month, 40% of it approximately gets into large and an equal 30-30 is getting into the mid and the small cap space. So, uh, you know, directionally, more money going into large, but it doesn't mean that money is not going into the other segments. Uh, that's, you know, paired, uh, kind of where the money is heading. Yeah, we've also seen a rapid influx of money heading into uh, thematic and sectoral funds as well. Have you had any concerns about um, the amount of concentration, the amount of risk that might be building in this area? Uh, you know, actually, if you look at it, uh, I would not say it's so much of a risk because if you look at various factors in terms of what's the earnings expectation, where the valuations stand, it, in pockets, valuations could be expensive, but it's not you know, the entire segment's overvalued. Uh, as well as this continuous liquidity flow, which is providing at least the short-term stability. So uh, I wouldn't talk about it being uh, too risky at this point of time. Uh, there have also been a few episodes of corporate governance problems at some mutual funds. Is this something your clients have been raising with you? Uh, so, yes, because, you know, there's a lot of noise being raised. Of course, there will be questions that come, but it also is comforting that you have a SEBI which is closely monitoring, uh, you know, each and every step of what the mutual fund is taking. So it actually gives a certain comfort to clients as well that if there's anything going wrong, you have a watchdog who's tracking it very closely. And, uh, uh, you know, given the current uh, issue, it's been around a week and you've seen only 3 to 4 percent of the assets as an outflow. Uh, so that is actually easing the clients now that there's not too much of a quality issue with the underlying portfolios and therefore, uh, you know, there may not be too much to worry about. Plus, uh, you know, the comfort of being in a regulated instrument, uh, that is uh, kind of now comforting uh, the clients, I would say, more than concerning them. I just want to get your views on some government policy as well, because, of course, we've seen an incredibly fast infrastructure build out. Uh, under Prime Minister Narendra Modi, but seen a few infrastructure failures as well. And uh, over the weekend, of course, uh, we had the partial roof collapse at the new part of New Delhi Airport. Uh, we've seen similar scenes at two other airports around the countries and four bridges collapsing in Bihar. Uh, do you have a few concerns about the speed and quality of the infrastructure build we've seen so far? And are there any risks around that? So, uh, you know, given that it's such a huge economy and a lot of infrastructure which has been built up over the years, of course, uh, you know, it's but natural that there could be certain accidents. So, uh, you know, while that is a cause of concern, I would not say it impacts anywhere the trajectory at which we've been growing in terms of infrastructure and the quality. Because if you have negatives, uh, you know, if you have two, three negatives, I'll say you have uh, you know, another seven, eight positives as well. So I don't think it's a deterrent to, uh, you know, government's focus on infrastructure building. And that is what is needed also very much today for, uh, you know, the country to progress or to go to the next stage. So I think in terms of uh, government's focus would continue towards infra, yes. Uh, these accidents would only mean that uh, government's focus on the quality uh, also goes up. Uh, but yeah, I don't think it will be a deterrent to uh, the speed or the money being allocated towards uh, infra. Yeah, in terms of allocation, we'll, we'll get a few uh, clues uh, very soon because, of course, the budget is coming up. Uh, do you expect the infrastructure allocation to remain the same or higher, or do you see money being spent in other areas as well? So, uh, you know, definitely the focus towards, uh, you know, infrastructure, the capital expenditure that's gone under different segments of infrastructure would continue to be there. We don't see that, you know, to be bought down. Uh, also, what's happened is the government, I'm sure, realizes that uh, social welfare policies is where uh, they've kind of missed out while they would have, you know, they have done, uh, uh, they've taken certain steps, but there is a lot more missing in that segment to bring down 
uh, the disparity between rural urban growth, unemployment in that segment. So we do expect, uh, you know, some of those social welfare policies which could you know, benefit the rural, benefit agri, uh, you know, bring up employment would uh, definitely get included. But that's also because government has, uh, I would say, a buffer in terms of its revenue. You know, instead of 1 lakh crore, government has got 2 lakh crore of dividend from RBI. So without having an impact on the CapEx plan, they will have a buffer to also spend money on the social welfare activities or, you know, those policies. So yeah, I think it's going to be a good blend of both these yeah. not compromising on uh, infra. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Shweta Rajani, we're unfortunately out of time, but thanks for joining us. Uh, Shweta Rajani there of uh, Anand Rathi Private Wealth Management. And staying with India, cricket fans still celebrating their team's victory in the 2020 Cricket World Cup. The nail-biting win over South Africa in Barbados at the weekend marked an end to the country's 13-year championship drought. And the win might also boost revenue for a sport that already dominates ad revenue and broadcast rights in India. The Mint newspaper earlier reported that the tournament's Indian rights holder, Disney Star, was expected to rake in more than $2 billion in advertising. Never underestimate the power of cricket in India. Plenty more to come. This is Bloomberg. Here's a look at the ceremony a little earlier on Monday, marking the 27th anniversary of Hong Kong's return to Chinese sovereignty. Bloomberg Originals has been looking at how the city is becoming more aligned with the mainland and what that means for its future as an Asian financial hub. When Hong Kong was handed back to China after more than 150 years of British colonial rule, Beijing promised a high degree of autonomy in its economic and political systems for 50 years. The city cemented its status as an international financial hub and one of the world's freest economies, bolstered by its rule of law, a free internet and press, and a currency pegged to the US dollar. But at the same time, tension had been simmering between Beijing and Hong Kong's political opposition, which wanted to expand civil liberties. And in March this year, Hong Kong introduced its own security legislation, New crimes like treason and insurrection carry life sentences. The threat to national security is real. But it wasn't just increased restriction on free speech and expression, bringing Hong Kong closer to the mainland. In 2017, President Xi Jinping unveiled the Greater Bay Area Development Project, an effort to integrate Hong Kong with Macau, Shenzhen and nearby cities. The dilemma for Beijing is that the crackdown on political dissent has meant that people increasingly view Hong Kong as similar to mainland China. It's its differences that have really secured and underpinned the success of Hong Kong for many, many years. And subscribers can see that documentary in full right now on the Bloomberg Terminal or on Bloomberg.com. It's also available on the Bloomberg Originals YouTube channel. All right, so let's take a look at what to expect at the European Open. Should be an interesting session this Monday morning. We've got futures positioned higher, the euro gaining as well, the uh, national rally performing very well in elections, although perhaps not as well as polls expected. That is it from Bloomberg Markets Asia. This is Bloomberg.